Welcome, everyone. This is Lisa Longhofer. We had a little technical difficulty, but we're trying to work that out right now. And I see the attendees are logging on, so we'll just give you a minute and give us a minute to get squared away, and then we will go ahead and get started. There you go. Does that look good? That looks good. Let me just. Um... Okay. All right. Why don't we go ahead and get started again. Um, my name is Lisa Longhofer. I'm the executive director of the gray muzzle organization. I want to welcome you all here today to our webinar and also acknowledge the challenges that we're all um, facing and I just want you to know that we're thinking of all of you and I think we're all very appreciative of the love that our animals give us in this trying time and we're very thankful that Dr. Sheila Robertson is here with us today to talk about new and integrated approaches to comfort for our senior pals. So I want to begin by just telling you a little bit about Dr. Robertson's background. Um, she has a career in veterinary medicine that spans more than three decades and includes numerous roles, um, such as a general practitioner, clinician, and teacher in university veterinary schools in the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States. She has served as a staff member of the Animal Welfare Division at the American Veterinary Medical Association and as a president of the American College of Veterinary Anesthesia and Analgesia. Dr. Robertson has published lots of peer-reviewed papers related to anesthesia and analgesia in dogs, cats, horses, and even iguanas, which I thought was pretty cool. She has a special interest in sedation, anesthesia, and analgesia of older pets and in helping them enjoy life to the fullest. So since 2017, she's served as Senior Medical Director for Lap of Love Veterinary Hospital, where she supports over 100 veterinarians by providing the latest information on pain management, geriatric, geriatric pets, and end-of-life care. And we are really Excited to have you here, Dr. Robinson, and, and really appreciate your taking the time to share your knowledge and expertise. So with that, I will turn it over, but let me just say that um, Dr. Robinson is happy to answer questions. So you should see in, I think, the right-hand corner of your screen, a um, chat box where you can enter questions and we will relay them to her and um, hopefully she can, she can answer those questions if you think of questions afterwards, you can feel free to, to reach out to me and, and we can hopefully try to get those questions answered. So again, welcome Dr. Robinson and Robertson and thank you. Yeah, well, so much uh, for having me here and um, thanks for that introduction. And I guess the one silver lining in amongst all the um, chaos within the world is that it is okay still to pet a gray muzzle. And if they're um, self-quarantining with you, I think it's uh, a great time to learn more about them and get to know each other even better. So yeah, I'm very, very interested in helping our gray muzzles and older pets and dogs and cats, but we're going to talk about dogs today, um, to really, really enjoy their, you know, golden years. And there's so much that we can do for them when we start putting the puzzles of pain together. And I'm going to talk about what a complex puzzle pain is some of the things that we can do, and then some of the exciting new things that are on the horizon that are going to help people in pain, um, but also benefit our um, older pets. So today's topic, you know, clearly got to say without, um, you know, goes without saying that we love a gray muzzle at Lap of Love. I love a gray muzzle. Um, and so we're going to talk about quality of life and how chronic pain may impact that. So quality of life is um, something that Dr. Mary Gardner has talked to this audience about how to measure quality of life. And I think of it as, you know, how does the pet feel about its circumstances in the moment? And remember, dogs and cats and all other animals, they think about now. They don't anticipate the future. So their now time has to be very good. And the things that interfere with enjoying life in the moment would be chronic pain and people you know go through this as well with chronic arthritis but mental health if you're anxious or separation anxiety 
that impacts on how they enjoy their life. And then other chronic illnesses, and we know what those are, the chronic kidney diseases, the diabetes and so on can have a problem, um, you know, really impacting on how they enjoy every day. But we're going to focus on chronic pain and how that impacts their life and lifestyle and also how it may impact the owners, but what um, the gray muzzle owners can do to help these pets. So probably the first thing to think about are, is what are the most common causes of pain um, in our older pets? Well, the number one thing that I'm sure everyone listening in knows is arthritis, specifically what we call osteoarthritis, which humans, cats, horses, um, dogs, lots and lots, nearly every species gets osteoarthritis. Some of it is with age and some of it is because of trauma or just um, some of their body conformation. And we'll talk about um, some, how being overweight can exacerbate this. The other thing that causes chronic pain, pain that goes for a long time, is if we don't take care of their teeth. So bad teeth, bad tartar, sore gums, that is a cause of pain and certainly dental care can help take care of that. And then something that we often think about is bad skin, itching, the sore ears, the infections in the ears, that can be really distracting and unpleasant for an animal when it goes on for a long time. And there's a very close link between itching and when it crosses over that line to being actually painful. But without a doubt, the number one cause of pain that lasts a long time in our gray muzzles is osteoarthritis. It is the number one cause. And I think as a very, you know, sort of guesstimate, at least 25% of dogs at some point in their life are going to be diagnosed with arthritis. And a lot go undiagnosed. And if they go undiagnosed, they don't get treated. Some of them are diagnosed with this disease, but owners are a little cautious or afraid to treat them um, because of some fear of some of the side effects of the drugs. And, and we'll go through what some of those are and how we're working to make sure that those um, are minimized. But I think it's a very, um, you know, that's a, an estimate. And I would say, certainly with the dogs that I in interact with now, a lot more than 25% of them have osteoarthritis. And it definitely increases as they get older. So it's much more common in our older pets. And so they have different joints that are painful, like you can see the sort of red painful areas on this beautiful gray muzzle here. You know, it could be the hips, the elbows, it can be the knees, um, it can be the spine and so on but it is a complex disease. So I want to talk a little bit about what the whole, what I call the pain cycle is. So we get this disease that um, it initiates, some of it is wear and tear, some of it's genetic, but you have pain and inflammation in a joint. And here we just have a picture of a knee joint. And then what happens when you or your pet has this pain and inflammation, you don't want to exercise as much because it's unpleasant and it hurts. So if you don't exercise, A, the fun goes out of life sometimes, and also you tend to put on weight. And so we get weight gain in our pets because of this disease. And then that cycle kind of completes itself by you know this closed loop. As they gain weight, we get more stress on the joints there's more weight pressing on these joints that are, are already painful and inflamed. So we have this cycle that goes on. And what we're trying to do with treatment is to break this cycle. So in this picture, we have at the top left, we have how can we decrease? How can we have less pain and inflammation? And I'll be talking about that there's a lot of drugs that will um, impact on inflammation in the joints. And then there's other modalities like acupuncture and laser therapy. And once we get the pain and inflammation in the joint decreased and under control, then our pets want to move more so they can move more. And that gives them back, you know, the joy of life and going out and playing and going for walks. And that motivates um, our 
gets weight loss back on the move. And with weight loss, we get less joint stress. So what we're trying to do really is break this cycle. But one of the things that we need to make clear is that once your pet or you are diagnosed with osteoarthritis, or we'll just call it arthritis, it's a disease that is very common. We know a lot about it, and we can do a lot to improve comfort and make these animals less painful. But at the moment, it's not a disease that we can cure but we can certainly treat, but we cannot cure it. So this is a long-term, lifelong commitment once we start um, treatment. So every um, dog that develops this disease is going to have a different story. And so when you are talking to your veterinarian about changes in how your dog is exercising, maybe they're limping, maybe they don't want to go as far. So what the veterinarian and you are doing is trying to get the patient history told. You're trying to tell the story for your dog. And the dog is telling you his story by his behavior and what things are, are changing. And then what we as veterinarians want to do is take all of this um, history that you are telling us and turn it into this dog's pain story. Like how is this pain story developed? How long have these changes been going on? Are all the behaviors that you're talking about related to perhaps arthritis in their joints. And that's what we always want to get the story straight. So here is um, a, a, an older dog with a concerned owner. And this is a dog that used to be very lively, not as lively, doesn't want to play as much, tends to be a little bit reclusive. And those are all things that this owner explained to us. And we worked it up and, you know, we're like, well, this certainly could be due to the fact that each day this dog is achy and uncomfortable. And because osteoarthritis is a complex disease, and I think owners are more than capable of understanding this disease once it's explained to them clearly, and then this helps them understand why the challenges um, face us about making comfort the priority and making a comfort plan actually work very well. So we go back to the picture of the old gray muzzle and a lot of older, especially larger dogs will have arthritis in their knee or what we call the stifle joint or maybe in their elbow. But the disease, yes, it starts in their joint and the joint is inflamed. But what happens is that joint is sending pain signals um, throughout the body from the joint into the central nervous system. So that's our spinal cord where all the communication happens and then the relay system takes that information to the brain and we go, well, that doesn't feel very good. And the dog is thinking, you know, something is going on in my knee. But what we need to understand is if that information goes unchecked because we're not treating the disease in the joint, what starts to happen in that spinal cord is it starts to change and get very confused and it starts to get what we call wound up and it starts to actually become its own pain generator. It starts to send spontaneous signals to the brain. It's kind of like an electrical circuit that just decides to throw off a spark here and there or whenever it feels like it. So what we've actually got is, is a disease in the joints but now we have changes in the complete um, entire nervous system of the dog. And so what that leads to is that not just the joint is uncomfortable or they flinch when we touch the joint, but everywhere in their body be can become sensitive to touch because we've changed how the whole body senses touch and, and, and other um, signals. So in this example, the gentleman on the left is just petting his dog very gently. But what you might find in some of these um, arthritis dogs is that they kind of like flinch when you pet them you know, on their back or try to go to brush them. And this is because of all these changes that have occurred. 
And again, a dog that used to like to be groomed may start to dislike that and really not want to be groomed because of this sensitivity to touch everywhere in the body. And that's something that we're going to address with treatment by targeting what's going on in the joints and calming everything down. We can calm this whole process down and somewhat return these animals to being a lot more normal. So chronic pain, um, I like to put it very simply, it's um, how it feels. So that's the ouch part. And so your older um, gray muzzle dog who has a bad elbow or she may have a bad knee, we understand that we've got an ouchy joint. But the thing that we have to remember is that pain actually is an emotion that we experience and it's always unpleasant. Pain is always unpleasant. So what we have to think about is how does that pain make them feel? And people with chronic pain will tell you that when they're having a bad day, they don't really want to go and visit their friends. Um, they don't want to, you know, do fun things. They just want to sit quietly and do nothing. So it makes them feel different. It alters how they behave, what they want to do. And that impacts on their quality of life. And with dogs, it's just the same. It impacts on what we want to do today to have a fun day. So treatment is something that I've you know, followed as it's changed over the 30 years in my career. And I always now look at treatments in two very different ways. We have drugs and we have non-drug therapy. And that's the sort of um, you know, the acupuncture and the physical therapy and so on. So what I like to think about is treatment is very, very holistic or what we call is integrative veterinary medicine. So we integrate the pharmacology and the drugs that are coming out that we know are effective, but we combine that or integrate it with some other non-drug therapies that, um, you know, it's not rocket science, and some of them are just how we actually look after the pet, um, how we house them, social interactions, and so on that help control the feelings, the, the negative feelings or the bad feelings about the pain. So all of you who have owned uh, an arthritic animal have probably had them on what we call anti-inflammatory drugs or as the veterinarians will call them NSAIDs. And these are just a few of the ones that are available and there's a lot available. And it is important for you to know that all of these have been very, very extensively tested. And then all that information goes to the Food and Drug Administration and is looked at for safety and that to make sure that these drugs are actually efficacious and help for the disease of osteoarthritis. So they are, you know, well regulated. But a lot of you will probably have had some issues with your pet taking some of these drugs. They are very effective and if your dog can tolerate them and some of the side effects we'll talk about, then they can really help decrease this pain and inflammation that is going on in their arthritic joints. So here's one of my um, gray muzzles, one of my very favorite gray muzzles that has ever lived with me. And this is Angel. Now Angel had pretty um, advanced arthritis when I um, adopted her into my household when she was about 13. But the thing with the anti-inflammatory drugs is she had a bit of a sensitive tummy. And so they didn't work very well for her. They, they would help with her pain, but then we were fighting the upset tummy. And that is what a lot of um, owners talk, talk, will tell us. Either a little bit of diarrhea, or they don't want to eat, or they might actually um, vomit. So one of the ways that the um, researchers of this disease have approached this is to try and look at um, drugs that are more targeted. So if we could target where, you know, more closely where the pain is coming from, we could eliminate it or at least reduce it, but have fewer side effects. And the problem with these anti-inflammatory drugs is they actually take out a lot of inflammatory pathways but some of those inflammatory pathways are actually needed for um, normal gut 
function or for the intestines to, to function. So one of the newer drugs that has come out that leaves the, the good pathways alone but targets the bad um, area of the joint where the inflammation is happening is a drug called galloprant. And some of you may have been um, um, had your dog put on that or this has been suggested by your veterinarian. So this is the move that we're making to be more targeted to just target the pain, the source of pain, but try and leave the things that are really important um, alone and not interfere with, with those. Some of the other drugs that a lot of you may have your pets on are drugs that actually um, quell or calm down the nervous system. So gabapentin is a drug that has been used um, to treat human epilepsy and now it's being used to treat chronic pain. So people with fibromyalgia might take this drug. And the whole plan behind this drug, if, you, if, if your veterinarian suggests it, is it calms down the nervous system. And hopefully I explained um, to you clearly that we're looking at the joint, which has inflammation, but we also know that the nervous system has become, you know, upregulated and much more active. So this drug is trying to calm everything down in the spinal cord. So that might be suggested. Another drug that works also on nerves is a drug called amantadine. And that again is a, a human drug and it works on diseases that are very specific to the nervous system, one of them being Parkinson's. And again, it's given to animals with this chronic pain and chronic pain syndromes to try and calm down the nervous system. So this is usually not a standalone therapy, but you can add this to one of the anti-inflammatories and decrease the dose of anti-inflammatory so that there are fewer side effects when you add this drug. So this drug is a human drug, but is quite widely used. And it's a drug that I certainly add to a lot of treatment protocols. The other important thing, really important, we talked about that pain cycle. If they don't want to exercise, then they, they gain weight. They gain weight, there's an added stress on the joints. But it's not just um, added stress on the joints. Fat itself actually is one of the sources of inflammatory molecules. So if a pet has a lot of extra fat, the fat actually releases inflammatory molecules that exacerbate the inflammation in their joints. And if we can reduce that fat in the animal, then we reduce the inflammation. So by keeping their weight under control, we serve two purposes. Take the strain and the um, you know, stress on the joints um, we decrease that, but we can actually lower the amount of inflammation in the whole body as well. So when we think about pain, it's complex. It's a puzzle. And we're learning from humans, and certainly when we look at our gray muzzles, that pain is influenced by a lot of other things. And the, one of the main things is anxiety. And you probably understand this yourself. If you are painful and then are put in a very stressful or anxiety dry, driven um, scenario, then pain becomes worse. And then we know that anxiety makes pain worse and those two are a bad combination. And the two of those together actually accelerate cognitive dysfunction. And all of you with gray muzzles know about cognitive dysfunction in these older pets where they start to act very confused, um, lose their training and so on. Just like people with Alzheimer's and cognitive dysfunction, they know that if they have a lot of pain and we can control that, we can actually decrease the, um, the path, how fast that pathway is going to decline with cognition. So a lot of the treatments for pain are aimed at decreasing anxiety and by doing that, that decreases pain and also slows down cognitive dysfunction. So some of the treatments are to actually focus on decreasing stress in the pet's life and decreasing anxiety, um, increasing cognitive treatments. So cognitive therapies are, as we would call, brain games. So I'm going to talk about food puzzles. 
the other thing is rest. Rest is very important for healing and for um, you know not being grumpy, basically, um, and not being irritable. Massage is something we can do that decreases stress, it releases a lot of natural hormones that are actually um, decrease pain. Exercise is very good for the brain, and exercise releases um, natural um, pain medication. Um, we call them endorphins, and most of you know that those work very, very like um, narcotics, but are in a good natural way. And then social interaction is something we have to monitor, but social interaction um, is very, very important for increasing mood. So these are all the things that we can work on that are, you know, nothing really to do with drugs to help our gray muscles that are um, uncomfortable with their arthritis. So rest and sleep are essential for everybody to maintain, you know, a good mood for the body to heal. And that's very important. So two of the things that contribute to good rest and sleep are melatonin and a comfortable place to sleep. So the gray muzzles do need their orthopedic bed. They need a safe place that's theirs and so on. But I'm going to talk about melatonin because it is a very important um, uh, hormone in all species and it changes and how it works and what it does and how it's released changes with age. So young people and young animals and, and old animals and old people during the day when it's um, daylight, we all have very low melatonin levels. But as the sun begins to set in the young animals and young people, there's a surge of melatonin at sunset. And what happens is that makes you very sleepy. And so the youngsters all get a good night's sleep. Now, the problem is as we age and as our pets age, that surge of melatonin doesn't occur. And that is why older people and older pets often don't sleep well and have short sleep cycles or disrupted sleep patterns. So what we um, can do is make sure they have as much exposure to sunlight as they can during the day. So that's outside time. And again, by definition, these older pets that aren't as active may have less outside time. So it's important you know, to get them out on the porch under supervision, get them out and exposed to sunshine. But the other thing is we can give them melatonin to try and simulate that release. So we can give them melatonin um, in the evening to help replace the uh, melatonin that they aren't producing themselves. But I do want you to, if you do that, or your veterinarian approves that as a, you know, a part of your plan, then check the small print. So there are canine melatonins that you can buy from pet suppliers, and there are human ones that are very inexpensive that you can buy, but you do need, do need to check the small print. And that is because a lot of melatonin that you um, can purchase contains xylitol. And xylitol is that artificial sweetener that is um, toxic, is poisonous to dogs. So if you are going to buy it, um, make sure that you read the small print and it doesn't contain xylitol. And your veterinarian will tell you um, about which ones um, are okay to use and which ones aren't. But you can double check on the small print there. And these are just some of the recommended doses that are given in the evening. And certainly these are starting doses and they can be um, actually increased. It's a very, very safe um, thing to give to pets. If anything, if you give them too much um, at the wrong time of day, they will get sleepy. But in the evening, this is what you actually want. You want to kind of induce this normal sleep cycle that will help them heal and rest overnight. Now, another thing that we're learning, and I've learned this from talking to geriatricians that look after people and reading the human data, when you become painful and you have chronic background pain, like arthritis, humans become very sensitive to noise and actually might become phobic to certain noises. So if an older person hasn't become hard of hearing, 
they might actually startle when the um, doorbell goes. They actually have a sensitivity to noise. And certainly after learning that about people, I've noticed that that's true of some of the older dogs that we haven't got their um, pain totally under control. So if you have a dog that has never had a phobia about um, thunderstorms or fireworks or noise, but develops that later in life, it could be linked to pain. And that would be one of the things that we would treat and look at, and that can help the phobia. So things um, certainly that I think are good for these animals, if they are very reactive to startling noises, um, you can have these signs on your door, don't ring the doorbell or please knock softly, um, and then leave messages for you know the FedEx or probably we should have Amazon there right now, um, and just have them leave packages so they don't ring the doorbell. And if you have friends that are coming around, you know, what they can do is when they arrive, they can text you and say, I'm outside. You can send them a, yep, I know. And they don't have, you can go to the door and let them in. Um, and the dog doesn't need to be startled. So just little tips. Um, so you don't have that disruption. Now, we did say that some of these pets might be a little more sensitive to touch. But once we start getting their pain under control with different therapies, one of the therapies we do want to introduce is actually massage. And there's lots of different types of massage. One is a Chinese type of massage called Tunai. And we like to do this because it gives the dog and the owner um, you time to spend together. And it makes the owner very responsible for being part of the treatment team. And the other thing you'll find is that these dogs that have painful joints, as they're walking around and they may be limping a little bit, what you start to find is they have tight muscles in their back. Um, so for me, when I'm standing lecturing, maybe for several hours a day, um, when I'm done, I have a very sore, stiff back. So I go and roll around or might give myself uh, self-massage. So here's my little um, gray muzzle, Angel. And she, we're outside trying to enjoy nature. And I have found like a very, you know, little tight muscle. It's like a tight knot. You can find them. And what I've found is like I found that tight piece of muscle there feels like, you know, hard. And she going, oh, please keep releasing it for me. So what I'm doing there is just trying to release that um, tight muscle for her and they often lean into you and they just start loving it and by doing that you're actually um, you know releasing the muscle and actually the act of massage releases things like prolactin endorphins and these are all feel-good um, natural hormones acupuncture if you have access to acupuncture it can be a very very good treatment for chronic arthritis and here again is angel and she used to love her um, acupuncture treatments and with that we get an increase in things like serotonin um, what we sometimes get from comfort food that makes you feel sleepy but also feel happy and we get that release of natural um, opioids the natural um, analgesics from the body with this technique. Some of you may have heard about the Assisi loop. So this is actually um, a veterinary product now, but there's a lot of information about this in the human world. It's targeted pulsed electromagnetic field therapy or technology. And it's a loop that you turn it on and here's Angel demonstrating her loop. She had some pretty sore shoulders and so it would go on her shoulder and then we'd do her elbow and then we would do her hip. Um, but we have seen some good success with this product. And the other thing that they're looking at is that different um, frequencies can actually decrease anxiety. So they now have these um, mats that are for healing or treating pain, but also anxiety. And remember, we talked about the link between anxiety and pain. So if we treat both, we're going to help. So that's a company that has a lot of different products um, and your veterinarian can help you choose the right product, but they may help um, a lot with your um, pet that has arthritis. 
The acts of daily living and safety are really important. So when older people are frail, like our gray muzzles and have arthritis, we need to sort of think about retrofitting their house, their home, you know, their garden, what they like to do and making it safe. And we need to do that for the pets as well and make things easier. So if you think about an older person, when they get up, it's difficult sometimes to get up. And this is because their joints are a little achy, but also because their muscles are weaker as they become older. And exactly the same things happen to our older pets. And so that's why we are big believers in recommending um, harnesses. So maybe a ginger lead or a help them up harness. So this helps get your dog up so they don't struggle and potentially hurt themselves. It helps get them up. The other thing is once they're up and you hold on to these leads and these uh, uh, mobility aids, it gives them a sense of security and they'll want to walk. They feel the support, you're with them and they will become more adventurous and increase their ability to exercise. So these are part of our whole overall holistic treatment. Other things that are important in the home um, are non-slip surfaces so that they can get around, get to their food, get to their water, get to their bed without slipping. So if you have a lot of tile or hardwood floors, you can lay down yoga mats or one of the things that we love and recommend are ruggables. These are um, ma um, mats that you can um, buy that are totally washable. You just pull them up, you, you roll them all on the floor, and then when they need washed, they go in a washing machine. Social activities and interactions. So there's no doubt that social activities and interacting with other pets and people are very, very good as a mood stimulator. And so here is again, my little old dog Angel, and we were looking after a kitten and they bonded. And so this is a good social interaction. And the kitten really seemed to understand the Angel needed her rest and he wasn't rambunctious and he seemed to very much respect that she needed her rest and didn't try and wake her up. And you can see they would spend a lot of time together. So this is important and it is like having social support when you aren't feeling, you know, at your best. So that is important, but it does need to be um, supervised. So children around animals that have um, chronic pain is something that we need to be very, very careful about um, because the dog may be the best dog in the world and a child like suddenly, you know, wants to jump on it or pets it inappropriately and the pet's not expecting it, more sensitive. So it's not a, you know, something we can't do, but that is supervised, must be supervised at all times. The other thing on this picture on the left, the dog on the right of this picture, he looks like he's maybe thinking, you know, you're my friend, but right now I really don't want to play with you. So supervised playing between animals is important as well. And we don't want a big rambunctious play date um, coming over to you know play you know with a gray muzzle that might be a little fragile so again that needs to be supervised and appropriate interaction but there's no doubt that when it's the right interaction it's going to raise their mood um, keep them occupied and that distracts you from your pain so the thing is these animals if they live in a household with a lot of people, with children and with other pets, there needs to be a safe place or safe places where they can retreat and it's their own space. So they can go away, you shut the door and they're safe and can have a rest. So that's important. Social activities, you know, here's Angel as she got older, it was harder for her to get to the park. Um, I could get her in the car and drive her there, but this little park that we loved and she loved, um, wasn't very far from the home. And she also liked to say hello to all the neighbors on the way there when she used, when she used to walk there. So what we did was we actually got her uh, a cart so we could go from our home up to the park at the end of the road. And she saw all of her friends and she saw her neighbors. And when we got to the park, as you can see, there's her cart in the background and she would get out and do all the checking of the um, P-mail 
and see who'd been to the park and so on. And if someone came along, we could supervise what the interactions would be um, when she was getting more frail. So this is one of um, the um, dogs or the two dogs that were her friends. And we would pass each other on the way to the park. And you can see they were always out trying to get their sunshine, their walk and um, their social activity. Um, very, very important to maintain that social activities. And um, these two dogs um, were Angel's friends and they would say, we'd stop and they, we'd all have a chat and then we'd move on and everybody was happy. Distraction is a technique that we use a lot in humans with pain. And this would be maybe children that are going through painful um, procedures with elderly people, anyone with chronic pain. If you can distract them, they forget about their pain. So they do things like art therapy and um, all sorts of things with people. And when you're occupied, you forget about your pain. And then when you forget about your pain, you don't dwell on it. And that actually helps reset your whole mindset and mood. So with animals, you can certainly um, do distraction. So playing, now it may not be chasing the ball the way it used to be, but you can still do interactive playing um, with, with toys. Other distractions are to hang like a bird feeder, right? You know, where your dog um, looks out the window or at the porch and just looking at the birds and listening to the birds, they can be distracted for a long time and this helps you know, improve their mood. And we do know this actually impacts positively on quality of life and decreases pain. Food puzzles, that's another thing to keep them distracted, fills up their time. But again, the other thing it's doing is it's brain games, right? It's stimulating their mind to stay active. And so we can get them to um, take longer eating meals. So that takes up time. They have to figure out how to get their favorite kibble. And so on the left here, you know, there's lots and lots of different um, food puzzles that you can purchase. The one that I found recently on a post is actually just a muffin tin, um, which I think is brilliant. And you put little um, pieces of food in the bottom and then put a tennis ball on top. So the dog pops off or lifts up the tennis ball or bats it off to get the food treat. And then you have a whole bunch of tennis balls that they might want to do something with as well. So that's a homemade, excellent um, food puzzle for you know, distraction, but also for keeping the brain active. So here again, Angel being the perfect model, she's like eating her dinner there and it's going to take her a lot longer to do it through a food puzzle. So she's going to be occupied for the next 20 minutes or so having her snack there. And a lot of you um, are probably were going to ask me about um, CBD or cannabidi cannabidiol in animals. And this is something that, of course, is, you know, taking over the market. People are saying, you know, I, we can treat everything with um, CBD. Um, it is putting veterinarians in a very awkward position because, you know, CBD is not the same as cannabis. As we know, cannabis can be quite toxic to animals, but CBD is something that could be helpful. But because of the legal um, implications of us discussing these products, and until we sort out all of that, you may find that your veterinarian isn't able to talk to you directly and can not actually prescribe or suggest CBD treatments because of um, state regulations and actually the American Veterinary Medical Association um, because it's a very, very complex legal situation at the moment, what we can and can't recommend when it comes to CBD. But we know that all of our gray muzzle owners are out there actually buying it online. So I think that we should do everything we can to help them choose the right product and to ask the right questions. Um, if we aren't legally allowed to prescribe it or sell it to them at the moment. So if you go online and you start looking at um, different CBD products, you should always find out from the seller, do they have an independent product analysis? So they should be able to provide that with you. That means they've sent it off to like the people that analyze pet food and it says what's in it. They should be able to give you a certificate of authenticity. That's very, very important. If they can't, give you that, 
this is not a product you want to buy. The other thing is find out where the hemp that was grown and was it organic. And the reason for that is some of the um, hemp and so on, if it's not grown organically or it's grown outside of the USA or outside of Canada, then it may have been exposed to a lot of pesticides and also heavy metals like lead and so on that are not what we want our animals to have. So these are the questions you ask before you purchase any of these products online. And then to finish up, um, some good news, what's on the horizon for chronic pain. So everything in medicine, humans and veterinary is moving towards what we call biological therapies. And it's about trying to use more simulating the normal immune system, the normal body and how it fights disease. And one of the ways that's being done is using antibodies, monoclonal antibodies. Now, you know, that's why we vaccinate is to raise antibodies so your pet doesn't get, um, you know, parvovirus and so on. But there's other ways that we're using it. So monoclonal antibodies are antibodies that are naturally produced by the immune system to fight things that shouldn't be happening in the body. And we can actually make those scientifically to mimic and um, simulate the immune system. So what we can do is man-made antibodies and make them to act against things that are attacking normal tissue. And they've just figured out, you know, a long, long um, story. They figured out certain things that we can actually um, neutralize. And so you may see in like just magazines and on TV that there are these biological therapies for different types of cancer, for rheumatoid arthritis, for that horrible skin disease, psoriasis, and for Crohn's disease, the debilitating GI disease. So these are, they figured out what is causing the problem and they're trying to mimic the body's immune system and they give these antibodies to the person so they can help them fight the disease. And the good, amazing news is that we found out that one of the things that is attacking the joint and causing the joint to be so painful with arthritis is something called nerve growth factor. So it really keeps the joint sensitized. It um, kind of like sensitizes nerves. It causes lots of problems in the joint. But we can now actually produce a monoclonal antibody that will snap up and sequester that NGF is what it's called. So it can no longer do the damage that it's been doing. And the good news is they're, they're developing this product for humans, but actually the veterinary market is ahead of the human market. So this is a, a monoclonal antibody that's been developed for dogs and it's being tested in several trials. It decreased arthritis pain, it improved mobility and um, how far these dogs could walk. It improved their quality of life. And then this is, it's called NV01 at the moment. And there's actually one in development for cats as well. And it's very, very likely the cat one will be on the market next year for cat arthritis with this one following close behind for dogs. And it's a, an injection that's given under the skin and it's given about every um, four to six weeks. So this is something that's um, very exciting for all of us. And um, we're, you know, looking forward to having this as an option for treatment. So pain is a puzzle. And it's a puzzle I've been trying to solve for most of my life. And now I find that the puzzle is complex, but we're putting the pieces together. And it's like lots of different things that we need to do to help our gray muzzles that have um, arthritis. So always talk to your veterinarian if you have an idea that you think, you know, based on what you read or listening to me that you think might help your pet. Of course, you're always going to talk to your veterinarian about that. And don't forget that it's not a simple, we're just going to give you a tablet and that's going to help your pet. It's looking at their whole overall quality of life, helping them sleep, be comfortable, um, you know, a bit of massage, some drugs. So it is a complex disease, but with motivated owners who, of course, love their gray muzzles, a lot of these gray muzzles can do so, so well. So I'd like to um, thank you for listening to me and hopefully 
um, that explained some of the challenges that you've been facing and now you understand why it's a challenging disease um, to, to actually alleviate the pain. So if we do have time for questions, um, I think I did leave time. I think our moderators are going to send them on to me. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Robertson. That was really fascinating. We've got some great feedback in our comment um, window about how much people have appreciated the information and they're looking forward to sharing it when it, the recording is available. So thank oh, absolutely. You very much. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it, once you understand why we as the veterinarians are challenged with this disease, it takes right. a lot of the frustration away from, you know, like you go, well, I tried this and it didn't work. And I think if we can, you know, really comprehend how complex it is and how multimodal or holistic the approach needs to be, but then knowing that we have, you know, very good um, scientists working on this with good um, treatments coming down the pipeline, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Well, I think you did a great job of, of laying out the complexity of it. So thank you. We do have one question. There was a question about CBD, but I think you covered that. Um, mm -hmm. Eric, if you're out there and you have follow-up questions, please type them in the box. Jane is asking if there's a harness you would recommend for an extra large dog who's 80 pounds and do you advise keeping the harness on all day? Oh, very, very good question. So the probably the two harnesses that I've had most success with are the ginger lead and they help them up. And the Ginger Lead, they have their own website if you just Google Ginger Lead, and they have them for all different sizes of dogs, from the very small to the very large, and certainly will cover an 80 pound dog. And they also are made um, because of the anatomy of males and female dogs are different. They've got them for female dogs and male dogs. And they can be left on um, most of the day. And then the help them up harness is something that you can work with that company. If you Google again, help them up, then you'll find all the different sizes. And those do need, um, you know, a little more like help with fitting them. But certainly I've had dogs that wear them um, during the day. Usually the owners will take them off in the evening. Um, obviously what you're looking for if they're wearing them a lot of the time is that they're not getting um, rubs or sores like under their um, armpits or under their, um, you know, their groin area. That's the main thing. But a lot of these companies that are excellent at helping you, they're great about taking phone calls and um, they might ask you actually to measure your dog like from, you know, from end to end and you know, actually measure how their circumference of your dog to get the right fit and so on. So there's lots of ways of doing it, but it, it is nice to have it actually on because if an old dog suddenly, you know, alerts you that he, he or she needs to go out to potty, um, it's nice that you can just pick up, you know, because they will usually still alert or start to scramble um, and you can just pick them up, give them that help and get them out before there's an accident. Um, the other thing that um, some people will do, actually, because you're not always in the same room, actually, is to put a little bell around your dog's neck. And, you know, you, you may leave the room and they're sleeping, but then they sit up and they realize they need to go potty. And you'll hear them, like you'll hear the bell go tinkle, 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 and you'll hear them. You can go through and see what it is that they want. And if it's clearly they look like they need to go out, pick them up and out they go. So wearing a little bell um, during the day is, or actually even at night, in case they get anxious um, or wake up needing something, wearing uh, a little bell. Um, and there's lots of recommendations I could give you because um, we do that um, for an owners who have a dog that seizures um, because then they know they can hear the bell every, if the dog has a seizure and they're not in the same room. So those are just little tips that um, just make you uh, a lot more, I guess, relaxed about, you know, not being, watching your dog all the time. Great, great ideas. We have uh, actually two questions about water therapy. Thoughts about water mm -hmm. therapy? 
Yeah, so hydrotherapy, or we call it hydrotherapy, water therapy. So mm -hmm. yes, so my little dog, Angel, who was a great uh, model for this talk. So Angel, um, you know, she would get tired fairly easily. And, you know, just walking is hard when you're supporting your whole body weight when you have arthritis. And she also had some degenerative um, uh, nerve disease as well, which a lot of um, anyone out there might have heard of what they call DM see it a lot you see it a lot in bigger older dogs especially like german shepherds so if they can go to a rehab facility that has either a pool or what they call an underwater treadmill that can be excellent because the buoyancy of the water takes the stress off the joints and makes the dog feel lighter so they're actually able to walk longer so they get really good exercise and sometimes they're actually in a bigger pool where they swim and the swimming of course like moves all the joints and the more you move the joints the more you increase um, muscle which helps um, take the stress off the joint and actually joint movement itself helps lubricate the joints um, and stops them getting stiff and, you know, sort of, you know, stuck in place, so to speak. So if you have a rehab facility that offers that, it's an excellent, excellent therapy for these arth arthritic dogs. Yes. Terrific. Um, all right. Um, any other thoughts about other herbal remedies or other natural pain relief? Yeah, so I didn't go into everything, but there are other, um, so some of the joint diets, um, those are actually well researched and they joint, the joint diets, if the, if your veterinarian, um, you know, there's not another contraindication that they can't be on them for some other reason, they contain a lot of um, natural supplements like the ones people are probably thinking about are chondroitin, green lipped muscle and fish oil. So these are th three things that are very, very good for joint health, but fish oil is also very, very good for brain health. So um, a very high quality fish oil, and then it needs to be the correct dose. Um, and there are sites that we, I mean, I could recommend that you go and they give you the, the you know, high quality recommendations and then actually what the dose is, they can be very helpful. Um, there is a drug called Adequan, which is actually approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in dogs. And that's to help um, with the cartilage that's inside joints that are damaged. And some veterinarians will, and I certainly um, offer that a lot. And so that's an injection that the dog um, can have twice, it's usually twice a week for a course of a month. And that can help. So those are other treatments. Um, you know, certainly when you're looking at supplements, there's no um, oversight on their quality. So you do want to buy from a reputable um, company. You don't want to buy human product at the health store because we don't know how you know, much of that is absorbed in the dog. So you do want to go to a reputable site that has good veterinary products. And I mean, I'm not, you know, involved with any of these companies, but Nutrimax is one of them. Um, but there's a lot of good um, veterinary companies out there that should have a lot of information or be willing to talk to you about um, the quality control. That's the big thing, the quality control about what's in their product. That would be the main thing. But I could probably um, send you um, a, a site that lists things like, you know, the, the right type of fish oil, because um, there's you got to get the right one and then the dose is needs to be correct but i could send you some information to post on that that would be terrific we would be happy to do that so we are just up at um one o'clock so i um wanted to say again thank you so much that was a really informative talk and for everyone listening, we will be posting a link to the recorded version on our website. So please be looking out for that. And, and yes, absolutely. We'll also post links to some of these mm -hmm. other resources that you've mentioned. Yep. And then so, if any more questions come in, just send them to me and I'll get that all together. And okay. um, yep. And so everyone, despite um, social distancing, can still pet their gray muzzle after you leave the seminar. I'm all for that. Yes, so am I. All right. <laughs> Thank okay, you, Dr. Thanks Robinson, so much for having me. For yeah. All right.
Take Thank care. you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.